All right, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 7.02 p.m. Let's get started with the roll call. Thank you, Chair Siegel. We will start with you, Chair Siegel. I'm here. Vice Chair Husagen has an excused absence. Commissioner Bortz? Commissioner Bortz is absent. Commissioner Hammond? Commissioner Hammond is absent. Commissioner Jones? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Law? Here. And Commissioner Tom? Here. Wonderful. Thank you. Our council member Cacciati is here. Thank you very much. And for staff present, we have Ted Gerber, our public works director, RP Kasparian, the environmental services and sustainability manager, and myself, Melanie Stepanian, management assistant. We will have Chair Siegel lead us in the flag salute. All right, please stand. All right, thank you. We'll start with public comment. Uh, looks like we have a few people here. Do we have anyone who would like to give a public comment? Yes, Chair, we have two public comments. Um, first, we will start with Mr. Kramer. Kramer? Kramer? It's, um... Oh, Mika, my apologies. Thank you. Merit there. I can. Um, good evening, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mika Kramer. I live on 340 Pasadena Avenue. And uh, I'm here tonight to ask that the welfare of our very mature and majestic, beautiful oak tree in our backyard, and subsequently the health of all the mature oak trees here in South Pasadena, um, to be put on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, our oak is estimated to be 150 to 200 years old, and I have a arborist report that I can give to you. <clears throat> so the owner of the property next door to our home is planning on building two ADUs, um, which are two stories high each, and they are 1,200 square feet, uh, or a little bit under 1,200 square feet each. Uh, one of those ADUs, um, is uh, scheduled to be uh, directly under our oak's uh, canopy, uh, which will require substantial cuts and restricting space for future care. The proposed location and the height present a stark incompatibility with the tree and the new building, and it jeopardizes the tree's growth and uh, viability and is in violation uh, with SPMC 34.4, which is um, the ordinance that helps protect um, the trees during development. Um, <clears throat> the presumably already approved plans require demolition, excavation, grading, construction to the foundation, footings, drainage, and fencing, and hardscape, all directly under the tree, uh, six feet away from the trunk, um, which is likely to cause irreparable harm. We're very concerned that our neighbor has gotten this far in the process of getting the permits um, luckily for us, started the demo without a permit, which then was stopped. Um, and we asked your help in ensuring the safety of our tree while still developing um, the neighbor's property. Uh, it states our property helps mitigate urban heat island effects and plays a very small but very noble role in the cooling of our earth, uh, which is crucial in today's warming climate. And we would like to do everything we can to ensure its protection and seek the support uh, from the commission. Uh, we're not against our neighbor developing on his property, but ask that it will be done in compliance with already established ordinances that are designed to protect our city's natural resources. Uh, as the city of South Pasadena navigates the need for increased developments, which we understand, there's a lot of pressure from uh, Sacramento. We urge that this is done in harmony with the character and also the environmental values of our city. We do not want such development to come at the cost of the welfare of our tree or for this proposed development to serve as a, pre a precedent uh, for jeopardizing the health and viability of other trees in the city. Um, can I hand you the report? You probably, you may already have it. I'd like to give you a copy. Of it. Let's Thank you.
I believe my husband is online wanting. Mm -hmm. I will handle the next public comment that we have in person and then we'll open the floor up to Zoom. So Michael 10, we'll have you for public comment, please. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, I know Richard, I haven't met any of you yet, but welcome to the committee. Uh, I've been a resident here in South Pasadena since 1966, went through the middle school, then junior high and the high school. Uh, I've seen how our city has evolved. A uh, reason I wanted to bring up the thing, and some of the will be questions coming back from staff, um, I would like to really examine the tree replacement prop, uh, procedures in the city. Uh, if, if, if a new resident comes in and takes down or permits to take down non-significant trees, which means anything that's not the species we don't want removed, like oaks and stuff like that, but they're under four inches, it should be the term, and but they remove them. There, I think the policy I was told by neighbors is that they're supposed to replace four trees for every tree they take down. Now, the one caveat is they don't, I've been told, they could be wrong, I'll be updated, that they those trees don't have to be relocated on the same property they were removed from. Now, the questioning is, if they're not, but they pay for, say, four trees, eight trees, are those trees being placed throughout the city and are they be, being used for parkway trees? What determines the species of the replacement? What determines where they go or, or significant ones? Is there, is, is there a waiting list for street trees? Because a lot of times if a resident wants one, they have to pay for it and, and, and put it in. But those trees, I'm assuming the applicant is paying for them, but then the city is determined. So the questions would be, I think it's DCA is the one that's, responsible. I, I don't know. They don't like me taking pictures of their trucks as they're doing things like that, but I think it's DCA. Uh, the groundskeeping is land co or land use, orange trucks that do our landscaping for our public areas and parkways. Um, I have some public information requests on those contracts, but uh, the question is to take a look at that and maybe staff can get by me, maybe refresh me. I'm 10 years out of compliance on what what the current laws are but i'm pretty sure the tree ones haven't changed we are still a continuous tree city usa right michael yeah. okay so want to check on that and see what's that because i believe if a neighbor new to south pasadena takes advantage of it clears a lot of trees but doesn't put them back in the area where they came from and we have no idea and it's left up to staff or dca to place them i'm concerned on where they're placing them because there's an issue of where some trees have just been placed in, in a park area. So that would be great. So thank you very much. Uh, and that's it. Because I'm, I'll wait for the other public information requests I have. So thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Ten. I will now open the floor to any public comments via Zoom. If you'd like to make a public comment on Zoom, please raise your hand. Any Zoom participants? Okay, we have one. Jim, I'm going to unmute you. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can, Jim. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, commissioners. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to repeat what my wife has so eloquently already put forth, but just to remind you that this concerns our neighbor uh, building uh, one of two ADUs that will be essentially entirely within the drip line of our uh, 41 inch diameter um, coast live oak. Um, and we are very concerned about the, the welfare of our tree. Um, we are uh, not against our neighbor developing his property, which is his right to do, but we definitely do not want it done at the cost of our beautiful tree that adds so much to our property uh, and to our lives. Um, it is extremely unfortunate that it is only now when our neighbors already started demolition without permit, so a little a little ahead of schedule, um, but that is only now that this matter seems to have uh, bubbled up to um, uh, a level of uh, examination by the city. Um, and I'm, that is not to cast blame on anyone, but it um, unfortunately puts us in a position um, where our neighbor is expecting to build and, and maybe all along has, has understood that he'd be able to build, 
um, but we'll feel enforcement of any aspect of SPMC section 34.4 will feel like a loss uh, as opposed to an anticipated matter of compliance from the outset. If this is the norm, it is possible many other protected trees in our city are in danger. Sometimes you don't realize you're on a slippery slope until you're halfway down it. And I would hate for that to be the case when it comes to our natural resources, which as we all know, are nigh impossible to get back once we lose them. Certainly a healthy, vibrant tree so old it was born in Mexico should be revered as something worth saving at all reasonable costs and limiting, not stopping, but limiting development to preserve it should not be considered unreasonable. If we lose this tree, we cannot get it back. We cannot get a replacement back an hour or our children's or our children's children's and even children's 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 lifetime. And yet anything that is built upon this tree that kills it could be rethought and raised as sentiments or new developers wishes are complied with. The tree and what it was, it was destroyed for lost because while trees are always rooted in creating a long-term legacy designed to endure, people could have far flightier plans that do not look beyond the short-term interest. I hope you'll consider bolstering the city's efforts to preserve a resource we depend on not only for beauty, but for the air we breathe and the shade we seek. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jim, for your comment. We will now open the floor to our last Zoom participant if you'd like to make a comment or anybody else in person if you'd like to make a comment. Okay, and there were no public comments submitted prior to the meeting starting, Chair. All right, thank you. Thank um, you. Just real quickly to comment on the comments. Um, I believe we have a tree ordinance discussion coming up later in the year, so that'd be a great time uh, to come back and, and view that and um, the staff has written down your concerns so that it'll be part of the discussion at that time um, and then as far as uh, the ADU that has to all go through planning first um, and they raise concerns before bringing it to our attention um, Les Ted it, correct me if I'm wrong but I believe that is the process and so we would wait to find on their findings um, yeah I could comment on that so um, all of the Sorry, this always happens. Um, all of the comments tonight are important comments. Um, we're aware of all the issues presented tonight. Um, we've talked many times about at the, through this commission, through our various tree hearings, how um, complex the process can be when development is involved. And yes, um, there is an aspect of planning commission approval um, when a tree is is when a tree removal or tree trimming permit is subject to review either through the NREC or through um, conjunction with the planning commission. We're evaluating the issue that was brought tonight at sta uh, staff level. Um, and so we'll be in contact with the parties to address this issue. Uh, but it, um, we don't have anything to agendize for this evening with regard to this, these items. Just a question for clarification. Um, is it possible for us to request um, from planning that commission that we have an opportunity to weigh in on this? I can advise, we can advise you that on that okay. as staff, um, not tonight, but we can advise you on how that would work with regard to the municipal code, um, with regard to the state housing requirements, with regard to the planning commission's um, authority. So these are the types of things that we're trying to work through, um, especially related to this case. Okay. And so we can provide you advisement on what that um, opportunity would be. Okay. Of Great. course. All right. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Ted, for sharing your expertise. We will now move on to item number two. We have our fiscal year 2023 through 2024 budget presentation by our finance director, John Down. Mr. Downs, just let me know when to go to the next slide and I'll control that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is John Downs. I'm the new uh, finance director for the city of uh, South Pasadena. And I'm here to kind of give you a brief overview of the 23-24 budget. Next slide, please. So the budget that we developed this year 
uh, was really kind of completely different than prior years. We started from scratch. So we did a zero-based budget. And in doing that, it, uh, it really involves a lot of collaboration with all the departments, community, the stakeholders. Um, we had significant community engagement, um, a lot of accounting cleanup um, in there. Uh, we've had unanticipated responsibilities that had to be addressed as well. Next slide. So during the community engagement, we had um, approximately eight uh, public meetings, um, starting from the May 16th Finance Commission meetings. We had two uh, community meetings on the 18th. We had a budget workshop on, the May, on May 30th. We had a Finance Commission meeting on June 1st, public hearing on June 7th. A, an additional Finance Commission meeting on the 12th, uh, followed by a, sp a special joint meeting with the Finance Commission and the uh, Council, City Council on June 21st. Next slide. So um, during the community engagement process, we, uh, we had um, an online survey uh, that was open between March 29th and, the, and April 28th. We had 152 responses. Uh, the survey was available on the city's website, mobile app, social media, newsletters, and local press. Um, and we even have here where you can scan for the results of that survey. Next slide, please. I think that's uh, way ahead on the slides. Oh, oh I'm, sorry, I'm I apologize. My printed copy, it, it looks different on the background, so apologize for that. So um, some of the major changes in the 23-24 budget, we added five new positions, accounting technician a in within the police department, a, soft, a, a sergeant, officer of professional standards. We um, added in a principal engineer for public works, a management analyst, and a water operations supervisor. We also reclassified three positions uh, within the agency. Um, the first one was within the fire department, um, reclassifying a management aid from part-time to full-time. Uh, within community development, uh, we, con we converted a, um, a management, a excuse me, I'm sorry, a uh, community improvement coordinator part-time to a community improvement coordinator full-time. And within management services, we reclassed a management analyst to a senior human resources analyst. Next slide. This reflects in a summary level what we're projecting to end the fiscal year 23 with. So we started the beginning of the year with a fund balance of 18.9 million. And think of the fund balance and government, we're, we're always talking in government speak, of course. Think of it as the equity. So this is, when we talk about the fund balance, we're talking about the spendable equity within the organization. The total fund balance will be higher than that. What we refer to as the spendable fund balance was $18.9 million at the beginning of 22. We anticipate $36.5 million of revenues within the general fund, $35.6 million of expenditures, uh, $2.2 million of transfers out, and uh, adjustments to reserves of $1.7 million. So one of the things I want to point out here is within the transfers out, the function of transfers out is really moving money between funds. That's really its purpose. And so one of the major changes that occurred during the, the, the pre prior fiscal year of 23 is the city incurred a very large uh, retro invoice for insurance from uh, California Joint Powers Insurance Authority. And because of that, uh, that really bumped up our transfers by just under $1.5 million. The original transfers were approximately $721,000, um, but we had that change. And we also had adjustments to reserves of $1.7 million. So we're projecting to end fiscal year 23 at 19, basically $19.4 million. Next slide. Here, this slide represents um, so the city has um, quite a few reserves that are very for very specific purposes. So these monies are set aside within the fund balance in a way that so they can't be programmed for anything else. To make adjustments to the reserves requires city council approval. So you'll see in here we have we have reserves from the from the Royal Golf Course, 
uh, vacant lot pur purchases, legal reserves, library expansions, maintenance yard, uh, community center, renewable energy sources, stormwater, library park drainage, fiscal sustainability reserves. Um, the Caltrans 6, uh, 626 uh, prospective litigation that used to be referred to as the Slater Reserve um, on there. We also have set aside for vehicle replacements, transportation projects being funded from a, the Rogan Fund Match Reserve, Stables Reserves, and mental health reserves. And so here what we're reflecting is, so we're never, with reserves, we're never talking about revenues or expenditures, we're simply talking about a change in the reserve. So the think of the reserve as the inverse of the fund balance. So if we're reducing a, a reserve, we're actually increasing the fund balance. It's the polar opposite. So we're putting it into fund balance, basically making it available to be spendable at that moment. So that's kind of the mechanics of that. And so you'll see in here, we've made adjustments to the uh, library park drain, um, excuse me, the stormwater for 300,000 for this fisc for fiscal year 23. Um, we've re re reduced the uh, library park drain, um, sorry, my eyes are jumping around here. The uh, library park drainage reserves. We've also, we've incurred uh, this last year, $40,000 of legal costs that were eligible to use the Caltrans 626. Uh, litigation, and we are programming um, the transportation pro pro uh, projects from the Rogan fund match at 1.4 million. So basically what we're doing is we're reducing those reserves by those amounts, and those those monies are now going back into the fund balance to be programmed for spending. Next slide. So this is what we're project or what we're uh, budgeting for fiscal year 24. And so again, you'll see our beginning fund balance, which is reflected from our prior prior ending uh, projected fund balance. Uh, our revenues are $39.5 million. Our expenditures are 39 point, $39,147,000. We have about $4,600 of transfers into the general fund and $2.2 million being transferred out of the general fund. And then a reserve adjustment of 300,000 with a projected ending fund balance of $17.8 million. So everything that I'm talking about now, I wanna be clear about is really for the general fund. The general fund is our operating fund. So we're using that to pay for you know police, fire, a lot of public works administration, community development, um, city managers, office, uh, human resources, IT services, finance, those types of things. So that's really our operating budget. And so most of the time, we're always really gonna be referring to the general fund as opposed to any other fund, which is much more restrictive and very specific purpose oriented. Uh, next slide, please. So here, this is what we're reflecting are the changes in the, in the reserves for this current year. And so um, what you're seeing here is the major change is we're simply um, tapping into the stormwater for the last of the of the fund balance or the reserve balance on that, which is three hundred thousand. So that's really the net change in the reserve for fiscal year twenty four, unless council during the course of the year decides to repurpose those reserves and make them available for programming. Next slide. This slide here basically is breaking down all the revenues within the general fund. And so a few things here that I always point out, um, property tax is always our largest revenue source. And, and the, the beauty about that is property tax is the most stable revenue. Some of the other revenue sources, particularly sales tax, can be very much impacted by economics, you know, different dynamics going on in the economy. And so you'll see here, we've had a very steady growth from all the way back from 1920 to where we are today for 23, 24. So very healthy property taxes in there, uh, special assessment taxes. Now, the other thing I wanna point out is in sales tax. So if you look at 1920, the sales tax is only $2.8 million. And then, but all of a sudden when we jump into uh, 2021 and further into 21, 22, you're seeing more than doubling of the revenue stream for that. And that is because the city implemented measure A, which is a three quarter cent sales tax. And so that was a huge benefit to help support public safety costs for the city. 
And as you see, it's continued to grow uh, for 22, 23. And then you're seeing in, 20, in 22, 23, we're actually seeing a, a kind of a slight softening. So we're projecting a little bit flattening out there and, and slight growth for this current year. And that's based on our sales tax consultants that do a lot of projection analysis for us. We receive quarterly updates. And so we're always monitoring both property tax estimates and sales tax estimates. Um, those are one of our two most sensitive areas. So we're always kind of tracking those. The next area here is the utility users tax. And, and this is somewhat surprising in the sense that you're seeing it, the steady growth in this. And the reason why I say that is there's certain aspects of utility users tax that are actually declining. For example, everyone's dropping landlines. And so the component of utility users tax related landlines is, is quickly going away. I don't know anyone that's really using a landline anymore. Um, in, including myself uh, with that. Uh, that's followed by, you know, so we have franchise fees, we have licenses and permits. Um, the other area I want to point out is where you see uses of money and property. And so I always want to kind of demystify this. It's basically two components that drive this revenue stream. One is the interest income on investments. The other is when the city has facilities that they rent out to the public for different public events and things like that, that generate revenue, and that falls into this category as well. Um, one of the other areas that I want to point out here, current services. So you're seeing current services really steadily increase, and basically what's happening is as we've come out of the pandemic, there's a lot more activity um, in here, and so that's really portending how you know, people are really getting back to a normal normal environment is what that's really reflecting in there. The, the final thing I'm going to point out here is where you see reimbursements from other funds. Basically, what we're doing is we have, we have insurance funds, and think of an insurance fund as a cost center for insurance, workers' compensation uh, claims, general liability claims. So it's like a cost center. And so we, we, in that cost center, in that fund, we estimate what we expect for fiscal year 23, 24. We then allocate those costs out to other funds and other departments. Think of it as charges for services to recapture those costs. So that fund should always be really in a neutral position. We always want it to where the revenues are matching the expenditures um, in there. And currently, right now, that fund is running at a deficit, and we're doing some analysis, and we're going to be making some recommendations to deal with that deficit on there. A lot of it has to do with actuarial assumptions into the future, um, and so we're thinking of setting aside reserves rather than reflecting a deficit within that fund. To We don't want to use up cash for something that could be 20 years in the future. Uh, next slide. This is just simply a graphical uh, illustration of the breakdown of those revenues that we just saw on the prior slide um, in there. And again, you're always going to see property taxes being the lion's share, followed by sales tax and utility users tax um, on there. Um, so those are generally the always going to be the largest ones in here. But the other one is also current services. And again, as I mentioned before, that just be, means you know, the economy and the public are getting back to normal. And so we're seeing normal activity ramping up. Next slide. This right here, we're simply within the general fund, we're breaking down the cost elements within the overall appropriations for 23-24. The primary, the primary cost is always going to be labor. If you think about it, cities are in the business to provide services. And the moment you say that, that's labor cost. And so it's always going to be the lion's share of the city's expenditures. So um, of our 39.39 million 147,000, it's 26,659 for labor. It's a you know 12.2 million dollars for operations and maintenance, and then a small amount for capital outlay for vehicles, equipment, and and, and such. Next slide. This is just simply a, a graphical representation of. Of the uh, of those cost structures within the overall general fund program. Next slide. Here is the the general fund expenditures by department um, on there, and so you'll can see 
it, you know, the, the, the two areas that are always going to be the largest is always public safety. Police and fire are always going to, to be consuming the, the bulk of the general fund operational appropriations um, in there. But you'll also see, you know, public works, community development. Um, and within finance, for example, you'll see non-departmental. And a lot of times that's uh, the finance department maintains like for bonds, for debt service payments, interest payments, and things like that. It's a central cost location. And so we that's where we, we budget those costs. Next slide. This is just another graphical uh, representation of what you just saw from the prior page, you know, breaking down from the city council, city manager, management services. Now, one of the things, uh, management services, uh, this last year we did a reorganization. So we consolidated a lot of activities to within management services. So we pull things out of the city manager's office. If you think of, um, uh, for example, we've consolidated like contract, uh, not contract services, but IT services, uh, human resources services, um, things of that nature, risk management in there. So management services uh, is fairly significant. You'll see finance um, in there. And again, you know, police and fire are always going to be the lion's share of that um, on there, followed by public works and community development. Next slide. So here, what we're, we're reflecting is just simply the overall, um, where you'll see uh, within the general fund, we're, we're fairly balanced. You'll see in the blue represents revenues, the orange is our expenditures. So we're, when we're developing the budget, we're always striving to have a, what we refer to as a structurally balanced budget. In other words, that our revenues are not being exceeded by our appropriations in there. Um, you'll see our internal service uh, fund, which is basically our insurance fund. And then we have quite a few special revenue funds. Special revenue funds are very restricted funds. So for example, we have gas tax. Those monies can generally only really be used for streets, traffic oriented activities. We have Prop A, which is generally for recreation and like bus services for things like dial a ride. Um, Prop C also for streets, uh, very restrictive monies um, in there. And so those, those are always kept separate and separate reporting on those. Um, and that's followed by the water fund uh, that we refer to as an enterprise fund. Um, successor agency, think of the successor agency, it's just a pass through. So when they, when they dissolved redevelopment agencies, what happened during that time was um, cities were allowed to still uh, receive tax increment for obligations that were incurred prior to the dissolution of the redevelopment agencies. So a lot of cities had bonds, you know, they issued bonds for redevelopment and so forth. And so they had a lot of legal obligations for debt services. And so they created a successor agency for that purpose. Now we include that within the city, but it is a separate legal entity from the city um, on there. The next is you'll see capital projects. So in here, you don't see any revenues associated with the Capital Projects Fund. And, there, and there's a reason for that. So this year, we created a new fund for just capital projects. And think of it as just a cost center. So all capital projects, all infrastructure projects are within this fund. And then what we do is we do transfers from other funding sources that support those projects. So within our budget, you will see a CIP by funding source schedule. And so you'll see all of the projects listed out and then you know their total project cost, and then going from left to right, all the funds that support those costs. And so that schedule also represents how we transfer money from those funds to the CIP fund as costs are incurred. So if we have a project, say for example, for $2 million for streets, and it's going to be funded by, say, gas tax, uh, Measure R, Measure M monies. Um, during the course of the year, you will see uh, periodic transfers from those funds as costs are incurred. So almost think of it as this way. The CIP fund is billing these funding sources for these costs. So the CIP fund will always be neutral over time um, in there. If there's balances building up one way or the other, that's usually a flag there's something wrong. 
they should by by definition they should always be the revenue should always be matching the the, the uh, appropriations within that fund. But we have very detailed schedules. We'll be posting those online soon. We're we're wrapping up the budget document as we speak. Uh, you know, just going through our narratives and you know making certain you know we've crossed all our T's, dotted all of our T, uh, all of our I's, and so forth. And probably within the next week, we will be publishing that on the city's website. Uh, next slide. So this is where I'm going to have Ted take over. And the reason for that is because this is very program centric to public works. So it's still budget related, but it's much more programmatically viewed. If can, I can, can say that. Before you do, can, can you uh, go back to the last slide? I had a question. Sure. Just from a, how this is getting shown, these are showing the expenditures and the revenues for the proposed budget for the year. So these are these are now the adopted. Budget. Okay, uh, uh, yeah. adopted. Right. Sure. I, I'm just trying to understand all the other. I mean, the expenditures and the revenues don't all match up. But I'm just trying to understand for the capital project fund you were just talking about. Yes. So where is the? I guess in terms of how it's showing the budget and the revenues. Yes. Um, the only one where the numbers don't kind of match up is the re capital projects fund, which I understood you said it's coming from somewhere else. That is correct. I'm just trying to understand on this chart, it doesn't what that, show where that somewhere else is. And that is correct. And okay. so, so transfers, whether they're transfers in or transfers out, are really technically they're not revenues and they're not expenditures. And, and if you were to look at our annual financial statements, they're referred to as sources and uses of money. Um, on there. And because of that, within the budget document, where you will see that is there's a fund summary. And what you'll see, so in the fund summary, you'll see your beginning fund balances. Then you'll see a column for revenues, mm -hmm. a column for expenditures, which we're referring to as appropriations. And then you're going to see two more columns, transfers in and transfers out. And so within that schedule, you'll see where the money is flowing Got from it. and to and then in addition to that, uh, I have more subsequent schedules within the budget document. So you'll see the, the detailed composition of the transfers in. So in other words, if you were looking at the CIP fund on the transfers in, you're gonna see all the details of where the money's coming in to support all those projects. And conversely, where the money's going out from the original source um, on it. And once the budget document is published online, you, it, you'll, it'll be very self-evident to you. And, and I have a copy of it here. I just didn't put this up for the presentation, so I apologize for that. I'm sure the accounting people already know this, but I do, so thank you. <laughs> no, absolutely. Thanks so much, John, for walking us through that. Um, so with regard to the Public Works Department overview, uh, so we have four groups we'll talk about, and um, we basically have four divisions in the Public Works Department. So we have our engineering division, which is also uh, associated with our administrative team of staff. And um, so most of this is general fund money, um, but they handle permitting, like we talked about the tree permitting tonight, uh, encroachment permitting, concrete work, any sort of work in the public right away. Uh, we review land development applications that have to do with the public right away if someone's making an alteration to their driveway or the street or a sidewalk. Um, our engineering group also handles our capital improvement program, um, budgeting grants, invoices, coordinates with other agencies, other cities, Metro, um, various agencies, and then also uh, handles the management of our public works commission, PWC, and our uh, mobility transport and transportation infrastructure commission, our MTEC. Um, our operations and maintenance are the staff that you would mostly see day to day in the city. It's our staff that take care of our buildings and our facilities, take care of our parks, um, manage our trees, uh, traffic signals and street lights, our street maintenance staff, our sewer maintenance staff, um, storm drain clearance, setting up traffic control. That's all of our operations and maintenance staff. Thank you. Um, our environmental service and sustainability, you're looking at that staff right now. Um, so a lot, obviously, through here. And this is what the commission has purview over, mostly other areas as well, but mainly this. And so our environmental service and sustainability division is funded either by general fund money or 
our uh, water efficiency fee. So a, a 14 cent fee for every 100 cubic feet of water that gets sold gets put into this account. And that's what funds part of our water related uh, environmental programs and the rest of the sustainability work, including you know the things we'll be talking about tonight, waste minimization, coordination with waste hauling, all the various programs, um, air quality programs, waste programs, everything that you know about uh, is in this division, um, as well as our climate action plan and green action plan management. And then lastly, it's our, our water division, which um, South Pasadena, um, uniquely, not that unique, but other than different than other cities has its own water department. Um, we don't just purchase water from um, an organization or have another agency manage our water. We have internal staff that do that. And so we basically divide that into our production staff that pump and treat the water and get it into the city. And then our distribution staff that you'll see, you know, reading meters, handling water breaks, things like that. Um, and then we also have at the, at the management and the administrative level, how we manage water, how we buy and sell and deal with our water rights and adjudication and then water quality issues and things like that. Um, so as far as the public works department budget, we had a lot of, um, you know, given the zero base budget that John had mentioned, um, basically looking at every, every account and every division from scratch to see how um, this all comes together. We evaluated what we needed to change in this budget. So a lot of it are um, operations and maintenance related items. Um, we wanted to increase some of the safety measures we have in place for our staff, um, making sure there's enough fire extinguishers in the city that they're getting inspected, that we have eye wash stations, first aid kits, things like that. Um, we had various cost increases that are just the way of the world right now for utilities. Most of our contract services, the costs went up with inflation um, or the cost of doing business. We did have a lot of um, repairs that we had to make this year that weren't necessarily budgeted for in the past year. So we made sure we had the budget for that. Um, various park repairs, benches, fences, things like that. Um, we needed to reestablish our previous budgets that we had for vehicles because we have an aging fleet. And so we need to make sure that we're maintaining them so that we can use them each day. Um, we added the slow streets program budget back into the budget this year. Um, so you'll see those changes coming about. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that in our, um, my staff communications. Um, and then basically increases across the board for professional services buying more system components for water because we have development going on. So people are adding um, water lines and uh, we've had to um, deal with increased water regulatory fees. So we have to add that into our budget. Um, we have a couple charts to show you. So we split the budget into the labor costs, the wages and benefits, and then our actual operations costs that go into our contract services and our professional services and things like that. So this is our um, labor costs. So you can see, um, as John mentioned, we do have a significant amount from general fund, but we do in public works, we do have other funds that cover our expenses like the water enterprise fund, uh, state gas tax, you can see on the bottom there in yellow, and then our sewer on the um, right in orange, and then various transportation um, funds. We mentioned our water efficiency fund. We also have our light, lighting and landscaping um, fund, and that's an interesting one because that's basically a property associated assessment that everybody in the city pays and everyone pays a base amount. And then people can pay a little, a, a different tier based on where they live in the city. If they have Edison street lighting or city street lighting or no street lighting, their costs um, change. And that fund we've talked a lot about this year because um, the, that assessment hasn't been raised in many years. And so our expenditures exceed our revenue for that fund. And so um, the strategy to accommodate that has been basically borrowing from the general fund every year. And so the council's given us direction, to try to resolve that in the coming year by taking a look at the fund, seeing if we can reassess the community um, with a increased tax levy. So we'll be talking about that um, at the end of this year and in 2024. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we broke this down into labor costs and also our operations costs. So clearly our operations costs for water are very high, mostly due to the um, cost to purchase water. 
Um, and I, and I, what I mean by purchases mean um, we pump it from the San main San Gabriel basin, but we have to pay a fee in order to pull that water out. It's uh, adjudicated and negotiated that fee, um, but we still have to pay that. And then we also have very high costs for treating the water because um, we have organics that we have to remove as we pump it out of San Gabriel and San Marino. Um, and then we have our other uh, costs for you know traffic studies and landscaping contracts and um, you know other maintenance contracts in the city. Thanks, Louise. Uh, so. As we adopt our annual budget, we also adopt a um, our capital improvement budget for this year, for one um, fiscal year for 23-24 about what we'll be spending. And at the same time, um, we actually adopt a five-year capital improvement plan. So we don't have that here that's available on our website, but that basically sets up what the future projects could be. But the ones that actually get committed are the ones that are in 23-24 and they're budgeted and and the budget is balanced so that everything, as you saw on John's slide with the capital improvement project program program at 16 million, that represents these um, projects. So this is, we've got a couple of slides here. It's not just these ones, but we've divided the capital improvement program into several sections. So we have our general building and facilities. Um, and here you'll see the new projects are the ones that have an asterisk next to them. The other ones are ones that are already in our capital improvement program and are already underway. Um, so we have a number of facility improvements that we're focusing on. Um, we have a new project there at the bottom. The city actually owns a residential property over by um, the Arroyo Seco. And so we do get some revenue from um, that tenancy. And so our plan is to put some of that back into improving the house. So there's some condition issues with the house. And so you can see that 308 San Pasquale improvements is, is for that residency. Um, we have a, a number of IT projects the city's on take, taking on this year. So some of these are either recent on this past agenda or will be agendized soon at the city council, including a new website, um, a new, uh, we're working right now on a new permit management system that community development and public works will utilize for permit processing. Um, on our community services and parks area, we have our existing project to implement, to construct the pocket parks. Um, and to complete the netting replacement at the golf course. If you recall, the part of the driving range um, fell down about a year ago, so we repaired that. And so now we wanna proactively repair the other sides of that so we don't have an issue if those come down. Um, we have a uh, parks master plan on our proposed budget to um, start to look at uh, you know, how to manage the parks for the future. We have a lot of open space in the city that we want to make sure is maintained. Um, and then we're going to start taking a look at the design requirements for um, one of our public um, open spaces, which is the snake trail that connects the Southwest Hills and the high school area. Um, I should mention that we, you know, given some of tonight's comments, we do have an urban forest management plan on our five-year capital improvement plan. It's not on this year because we don't have the budget for it and um, the resources to pull it off. But that's something that we're very hopeful, you know, given the changes that we make to the tree ordinance, that we can implement a overarching plan for how we will be able to sustain the city's urban forest. Um, we separate out the library uh, apart from our building and facilities because it's got so much going on. It's a very unique facility. So we do have, uh, we just recently completed a facility assessment of the library to find out what the short-term needs are. Um, and so we have a list of improvements that we're going to be making there, including the library's roof. Thanks, Nellies. Um, and in our utility areas, we have ongoing work to complete some of the sewer system rehabilitation um, projects that are required uh, by the state. And then we have a list of our um, stormwater projects. We've talked about those here. We have some larger regional projects. Um, and then we also have, you know, as this commission had recommended that make sure that we have some distributed small projects. And so we have our city hall, a uh, small stormwater project with just basically some um, stormwater capture cisterns underneath the parking lot here across from city hall. We do have um, capital improvement uh, money programmed into our sustainability division. 
So we have some water efficiency money um, associated with our climate action plan. Um, we don't have that allocated to a specific initiative, but we have money set aside to, um, to do some work there with the direction from the commission. And then we have um, some of our electrification projects there. The charging systems we're putting in at City Hall for both public use and for the police fleet use. Um, and then the Clean Power Alliance <clears throat> solar panel project that's across the way here. City doesn't pay for that project. However, it is a public works project. So we do include it in the capital improvement plan. I think the last two, yes, yeah, streets. So streets are self-explanatory. We have a number of um, repavement repair projects um, that we have going on this year, as well as some sidewalk improvements. And then we have a list of our transportation projects uh, there, our Fremont Huntington project, our Fair Oaks traffic signal synchronization, our fee installation. Um, and then we have two smaller scope projects um, through our Measure M um, program, which are to uh, make changes to the that kind of funky northeast corner of Fair Oaks and Gravalia, where there's that kind of wide turn, and then also various pedestrian crossing devices throughout the city. Lastly, we have our water. Um, so we have our water main pipeline repairs, which we're hoping to coordinate with our street improvement project. We have a um, study of the Raymond and the Baliki water towers. So um, the Baliki water tower, which is the, the tall water tower in the hills there, that would not go away. It's an iconic structure, um, but there's a possibility we would stop using it as a actually water pressurization device in the city because there's other more modern and efficient ways to um, move and store and, and utilize water. Um, so that's what that study would evaluate. Um, our next biggest water project is the West Side Reservoir. And so we're hoping to move into the design phase this fiscal year. We have various small site improvements we need to make to various water facilities. Um, and then lastly, the advanced metering infrastructure, um, which would basically deploy smart water meters, which would help a lot with water efficiency and um, staff efficiency in terms of um, billing. So we made it through the presentation. So any questions for um, our finance director or our public works staff? Uh, all right, well, I'll ask some then. Let's see. Um, lots of stuff. So I definitely would like to see the print-up version later because it's it's a lot. And thank you for coming out. This is uh, very informative. Um, as we were going through, I didn't get the chance to really hone in on some of the, the graphs. Um, I saw that you know we account for items like Measure M, the various measures. How about uh, other smaller grants and other things that come in? It looks like, obviously, we pull from different sources for capital improvements, where does that kind of fall in? I can mention something and then maybe John can also um, add if you'd like to. Um, we have one chart, which we didn't include, but it basically uh, shows um, how all those various funds contribute to um, the capital improvement plan. You can see there's like 20 plus funds there's, and there's various grants. Like for example, we have a, a $45,000 grant from the from the San Gabriel Valley COG. And that actually shows on this um, operations at the very bottom because it's not a, it's not a capital improvement pro, pro, uh, project, but that is to actually do some of our slow streets installation. So it's gonna cover the traffic calming temporary devices that we're putting in on various streets in the city. Um, so we use measure M and measure R to pay for some of our staff. Um, we use it to pay for traffic studies. Um, we're using Measure M and Measure R to pay for, and I was also going to mention this in the, in the staff communications, the you know very large effort that we're going to be doing for our Fremont and Huntington projects to bring the community members in, including NREC, to talk about active transportation priorities and goals. Um, so yeah, we could we could go through the list. We've got um, quite a few: uh, Proposition A, Transit; Proposition C, Measure M, Measure R. Um, We've got various grants. We've got money from Cal Recycle that we're hoping to use this year, about $30,000. So there's, there's a lot. And so it kind of- all, They're all there. They're labeled. It's just 
Yeah, but, so this this covers just the ones we use for operations. There's right. many more that right. we use for capital improvement. There's highway safety improvement funds. There's um, Rogan funds. There's a, there's a whole list. Yeah. And I apologize. I was just really focusing on the operational side of things. We have quite a few funds. Um, some of the major ones, for example, we have state and local fiscal recovery uh, fund, which is referred to as SLURF. And what that is is um, with the Infrastructure Act uh, that passed by the Biden administration, um, it was referred to as the American uh, Rescue Plan Act, ARPA. And so uh, cities that had populations of greater than 50,000 received direct allocations from the, from the federal government through the Treasury Department. And for cities that had populations smaller than 50,000, the allocations went to the states and then the states reallocated from those pots of money to various uh, public agencies. And so uh, South Pasadena falls into that later classification. And so that's why it's referred to as a state and local fiscal recovery fund or slur fund. So the city received uh, $6,059,000 of slur money um, they received it in two tranches, and, and that's how it was even for the, the larger cities. They received it in two increments um, in there. And one of the things that originally that was going on with that particular fund is it was so restrictive that you, you had two choices. The first was if you could show losses from the pandemic, though those losses could you could use to put back into the general fund and use for normal municipal services. Uh, the rest of it was highly restricted. It was primarily used for like um, housing assistance, uh, water infrastructure programs um, on there, and um, NIT broadband for the community. In January of 22, they changed the regulations related to that. And I'll put it put it this way. So before, so say if you were, if you got an allotment of say $10 million and, and, and but we only projected $4 million of revenue loss because of the pandemic, we could only use $4 million for normal municipal type of services. The rest of it was very difficult to use. After January of 22, they rewrote the legislation, the statute, and basically, I, I kind of put it in the terms of like, think of a standard deduction on tax return versus an itemized. They, they said, okay, up to $10 million, you can say is a, gen, is a loss of revenue. And so if you have money up to that point, you can use it for general municipal services, anything beyond that number, then you had to fall into those different categorizations that I mentioned um, in there. And so with a city such as South Pasadena, that basically allowed them to use 100% of it for municipal services. So we have a very detailed budget for that, for those, those revenue streams um, on there. That was a major change because a lot of cities were having a very difficult time spending the money um, on there. So that's one of the major revenue sources. Uh, gas tax is always another one. Uh, measure M, Measure R. Uh, those monies, they're basically their sales tax that are driven from fuel purchases. Um, and then those allocations flow through to Metro. Uh, and then Metro uh, disperses them. They give allocations to the various uh, public agencies in there. And so they, in addition to like uh, Measure R, Measure M, um, Prop A, Prop C also flow through Metro. Now, on all of those funds, they're, they're very restrictive. Matter of fact, Prop A and Prop C are so restrictive, a lot of cities try to sell it to other agencies for some percentage on the dollar um, on there. When I was the finance director for the city of Palos Verdes Estates, I sold Prop A money to the city of Torrance at about 60 cents on the dollar, and it's because I couldn't use the money because it was so restrictive. So I might as well take 60 cents on the dollar and put it back into the general fund um, on there. So there's a lot of that with some of these unique funds, if you will, because they are just so restrictive. And then you will see within the CIP fund itself, most of these other funds are transferring their monies to the CIP for those purposes um, in there. And again, uh, give us like a week. We will have this posted on the website. 
And then there's a summary schedule where you can see where these monies, so these two columns where you see these transfers in and out, they always match in total. And so you can see, okay, I can see it coming from the general fund. I can see it flowing into these other funds, vice versa on there. So it makes it very clear visually for you to follow that flow with those with those monies. Yeah, I'm de definitely interested in seeing that. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I apologize. Uh, you know, I wasn't thinking of putting the whole budget no, out there, but, <laughs> uh, uh, but we do have it there. And, and one of the things in here is we've, Again, we really developed this from a zero base. We started from scratch mm -hmm. on everything. And part of that is an internal control process. So we have detailed schedules. So say, for example, in one of Ted's de uh, divisions within his department, say he has like a you know, professional services and just say arbitrary, it's like $2 million of budget for prof professional services. We actually have very detailed schedules, what makes up that $2 million. And the reason for that is several fold one of which is to control spending. So when a, when a requisition or a purchase order comes to finance, we go to these sheets. Is it on there? It's kind of a yes or no. If it's on there, okay, then we go ahead and approve the purchase order for, for uh, uh, expenditures. If it isn't on there, then it's a two-part question. Is something else dropping off and we document it? Or you have to go back to the council for an appropriation because this money, even though it hasn't been spent, is already committed. So it's an internal control mechanism. So we have very detailed schedules. And again, that's all part of the zero-based approach with this. And it's just a, a control mechanism. It makes it much easier for finance to manage. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, and thank you for mentioning uh, the uh, money that has been put into the budget for uh, the Climate Action Plan. That's very exciting to hear. Um, so I'm sure we will Look forward to that discussion when it comes up. And I think that was also one of the reasons why we wanted to have this discussion and later in the year was to see um, what we could do to influence uh, future budgets so that we could increase some of the budgets towards sustainability, et cetera. Um, and so this is very helpful and um, thank you very much. And one of the things that we can do at a, at a, at a later meeting if, if, uh, if the commission's interested, uh, we can go through the CIP budget in in very great detail so you can see how everything's being programmed out from the funding sources um, on there. So so we're happy to offer that at, at some future meeting. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I, I just one, one more, actually. Um, so triggered by Chair Siegel's comments. Um, so, you know, we talk about implementation of the Climate Action Plan, but also, you know, I was reading the the general plan, the draft general plan that just came out. And I was actually blown away by how many things are actually, you know, adjacent to what this commission talks about. Like it really is a, a large number of policies and actions that are, that are talking about sustainability or, you know, adapting to climate change or, uh, you know, uh, other topics that are related to, to maybe even line by line in the climate action plan. And then when I hear in our, in our meetings here, I hear a lot about, you know, uh, how staff are, you know, doing their best, but they're limited budgets, and it's sort of year by year that we respond to what we what we can do. I wondered if, you know, uh, we could sort of uh, change the way we talk about this and more, you know, plan this out, say many years in advance, and say, is there a way to get like a a steady revenue stream that would help help us meet this on a strategic way, um, whether it be climate action plan or just general, you know, environmental um, topics. So, you know. For the library, there's a dedicated tax, right? Like, you know, right, is there like right. a climate mitigation tax or something like that? We could actually plan this out years ahead, sure. hire people and do like a 10-year plan for doing for doing what we want to do. Yeah, th th we, there's a lot of different ways of, of handling it. Um, you know, we can set aside reserves. We can, you know, dedicate a certain percentage from certain revenue streams. Um, in addition to, you know, uh, what Ted's already been doing in terms of, you know, looking for grant money and things like that. Um, there was a conversation today, for example, of uh, looking at uh, the purchase of a fire truck, an electric fire truck um, on there and seeing if there's availability of AQMD money to help offset those costs and things like that. So there, there is money out there, but it does take time to kind of search it out what's available um, on there. Uh, and again, these monies are generally highly restrictive monies. Um, but 
Uh, the short answer is yes. There, there, there are a lot of ways that we can approach this. Right. I guess part of my part of my question is that uh, I get the sense that the staff spend probably a, a big bulk of their time on just out finding that money and negotiating that money. Whereas if there was something like, say, how the library operated, where you could just say, "Oh, let's spend our climate money." Right. Well, um, yeah. So, we, and across the board, that's the case. Like, even for the library, we, you know, had to conduct an assessment to justify the grant that we just recently requested the library to the state. And so, we'll see. Hopefully, we get that money. Um, but yeah, you're right. A lot of this is finding those opportunities, um, doing the technical work to apply for them, applying for them, and then seeing it through to actually a funding agreement, which is a challenging process just to get the money into the budget for use. So, um, you know, we have the uh, Mobile Source Reduction Committee. Uh, you'll see $500,000 approximately in this year's budget that is helping fund our police electrification transition. That was a um, long process that Council Member Cacciati helped us out with quite a bit. Uh, and some of our um, former and current uh, NREC members in order to get that um, funding in play uh, we're still trying to finalize all the agreements that we need in order to access that money. Um, but those opportunities are, are, are out there. They're difficult to get. At the moment, we have that, um, some Cal Recycle money, a couple other smaller sources. But most of the sustainability program is programmed by the general fund. And as you can imagine, the demands on the general fund are high. Um, so to have another, um, another revenue source would be beneficial in terms of trying to accomplish those goals. I think when the twin, the, ca the cap, the climate action plan was established years ago, I think there was at least a $2 million price tag on accomplishing all the goals. Um, and so where we have funding to bite off the water component of that, uh, you know, all the other components are hard to come by. So yeah, so there there is a lot to say about planning forward, trying to find revenue sources now that can be basically programmed in the coming years. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys so much. All right, uh, I guess we're moving on to item number three, our single use plastics task force selection. All right, good evening, commission. Um, happy plastics reduction, plastic free July. Um, we are here this evening to talk about our plastics task force. This was an item that the commission had brought up during our work plan discussions and, um, had ex uh, requested that the commission form a task force to keep our plastics reduction, um, goals, um, in mind throughout the year. So we have added um, two additional discussion items to our work plan. And um, we are selecting today the task force and we can select up to three commissioners to serve on the task force. Um, I had a brief um, staff report um, that talks about some of the uh, plastics related initiatives that the city has already taken. Um, things like banning plastic bags, banning polystyrene, the inclusion of plastic reductions in both our green action plan and our climate action plan. Um, we have a brief, um, some information on AB 1276, um, which is a state mandate for single-use foodware accessories and standard condiments. Basically, it just means that um, uh, food service places are not uh, allowed to automatically hand out single-use um, plastics and utensils and condiments. Um, customers must ask for them. So that is something that is in place um, now. <laughs> The recommended duties for the plastics task force, and again, this is just recommended, uh, come straight out of our green action plan. I've listed them here as uh, being to develop a plastic-free zero waste guide for city events, something that the commission had already talked about. 
um, and during that discussion had asked to create this task force, providing workshops for parents to teach them how to prepare zero waste lunches. This is something that was listed in our green action plan that we have yet to find the resources to complete. So perhaps this is something that the task force might want to take on. Um, exploring the possibility of establishing an ordinance to adopt and implement stricter restrictions on the use of single-use foodware accessories than those required by AB 1276. So uh, again, that's a um, state mandate. Um, the city can implement stricter uh, local ordinances. Um, so that might be something the task force would want to look at. And lastly, exploring the possibility of banning single-use plastics in food service stores. So that's something that has been a topic that the commission has um, touched upon for several years now. So maybe that's something that the task force would like to take on. These are just suggestions of what um, I think might be best for the duties for the task force. The task force can of course come up with um, some other additional things that they want to talk about, um, other programs or initiatives that's they, that they see might be important to implement or bring up with the commission. Um, uh, that is of course up to the task force to do. Um, the task force would meet outside of the commission meetings. Um, and I have tentatively here scheduled the two additional discussion items for September 26th and February 27th. Um, of course, that's subject to change. If the task force has another date in mind or if they're not available, we can change that around. That's where I fitted it in the um, work plan for now. We can go ahead and change that. Um, so these are my recommendations. Um, so if you have any questions, I can take them now, or if the commission would like to discuss the duties or to go ahead and start nominating uh, commissioners for the task force. I was just curious if any of my fellow commissioners who aren't present here tonight have um, expressed interest. Um, I'm not sure if any of them have formally expressed. No, not to you. No. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah, that's I all I wanted to know. Yeah. But I know some of them have taken interest in this mm -hmm. in the past, so. Yeah. I'm sure like other things, uh, we can nominate them mm -hmm. and they can decline if they choose to. Yes, we can do that. If there is a commissioner who is absent today, um, we can still have them on the task force. And then if they uh, decline, uh, then we can talk about it again. Would there be other um, staff involved in this, or would it just solely be a? NRAC it would be. Thing? It would be more led by um, the task force themselves. So it would be up to you to um, meet outside of the commission, um, and you can come to me or um, your chair to let them know when you're ready to bring a discuss a discussion up to um, the NRAC meeting. Okay. Remind me, do these meetings have to be, um, are these Brown Act meetings and do they have to be noticed and everything or are they not? I can't, I can't remember how this works with the task force. No, um, it, it would be something happening separately. We won't, it wouldn't be like a quorum uh, of like an NRAC, um, which is why we can only go up to three um, commissioners. Um, yeah. Right, I mean, and but that means you could, with the, the meetings could be and just for purposes of convenience. I'm just trying to understand the meetings can be virtual, for example, as opposed sure. to being in person. Okay. So, so the sorry, um, if you could flash up the list again, that would be nice. But the um, the list of tasks is uh, defined in advance and is constrains the topics that are discussed or the actions, or no, it can be free. Um, I wouldn't want to. Um constrain the task force. I would like to recommend a guide for the task force. Um, of course, we're always looking for um, ways that we can work on our established plans and see how we can um, get those, you know, um, actions completed. However, it doesn't mean that the task force is not allowed to talk about any other um, you know, plastics topic that comes up, that is up to the task force. Right. I do see that you, you explicitly mentioned the, um, 
the, the action plans we have and you drew from those to develop that list, right? That's good. Yes. The other question I had was, um, uh, you know, state policy moves so quickly. I have trouble keeping up, uh, but often it, you know, it, it kind of rule overrules anything we can do at a local level and does something dr often very much more <laughs> uh, dramatically. And um, so I see you mentioned AB 1276, you know, it said it's an adopted mm -hmm. law. And so that's good. Um, if we could talk about iterations on that, but are there others in play that might sort of obviate the need for us to talk about plastic bags, for example, or things like that? I don't keep up. Not with that, that I, <laughs> none that I can think of off the top of my, my head. Um, um, but that might be something that the task force might want to look at is what, what are some things that are coming down the pipeline through the state? And um, are there things that um, steps the city can take to create local ordinances and and things like that. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Can we formally nominate people now, or um, are there other are there questions? Any more comments or questions before we do? Uh, the floor is open for nominations. I'd like to um, nominate, um, oh gosh, Commissioner Michelle. Why is her her last name Hammond? Thank you. <laughs> Um, how does it work? Do we just all throw out names or? Sure. All right. <laughs> Are there any commissioners here tonight who would like to serve on the task force? I would be, I would like to serve on the task okay. force as well. Any others? Raise your hands if you would like. Okay. Um, are there uh, one other commissioner I hear is Commissioner Bortz. Did she ever say that she would be interested in it? Uh, all right, again, rules around this. We don't have, if we, we have, let's say we have two that commit and one deny, declines. We don't have to go through a voting thing. It's just, it'll be those two people, right? We don't have to keep coming back and doing these Ye nominations. Right, um, we can do, official. I would say minimum two up to three. Right. So um, if we start with three, end up with two, if no other commissioner would like to join the task force, then we, you know, we don't have to keep bringing it up. Perfect. Then I will nominate Commissioner Bortz. If she would uh, choose to accept, that would round it out to a nice three. Okay. Is that a motion, Chair Siegel? Um, so I, I, I'm motioning all three. Okay. Wonderful. I know that was a question. I guess I am motioning all three. I would like to... I'll second that. So we have a motion to nominate Commissioner Hammond, Commissioner Jones, and Commissioner Bortz as the Single-Use Plastics Task Force. We have the motion by Chair Siegel and a second by Commissioner Tom. I will now have a roll call. So Chair Siegel? Yes. Vice Chair Husagin is absent, Commissioner Bortz is absent, and Commissioner Hammond is absent. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Law? Yes. And Commissioner Tom. Yes. <clears throat> Wonderful. We have selected our single-use tasks for force. The motion passes passes four to zero. Oh. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Moving on to item number four: approval of last meeting's minutes. Um, I believe they're in the packet, so I'll give you a chance to peruse. Oh yeah. I'll move approval unless people need more time to review. I'll second that. Wonderful, thank you. We have a first by Commissioner Tom and a second by Commissioner Jones. I will now go through the roll call once more. Chair Siegel? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Law? Yes. And Commissioner Tom? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. The, the uh, minutes for the June 27th NRAC meeting have been approved. Thank you, with four to zero. Oh. All right, moving on to communications. All right, City Council Liaison. 
Chair Siegel, Commissioners, thank you, staff. Um, just want to let you know why I've missed a number of meetings in a row. So I, as a AQMD board member this year, vice chair, every about two or three years, I go to my 34 cities I represent from Santa Clarita to Claremont and in between. I make a presentation on all of our incentive programs, what AQMD does, how we were founded, how they can help uh, provide clean air as a city municipality. And all the programs available to their businesses, for their residents, for school districts, et cetera. So I've completed 32 of the cities. I spoke at San Gabriel last Tuesday night, South Pasadena here, Wednesday night. Just got two more cities, Bradbury and Monterey Park, which meets at the same time as South Pass. So it's a little tough. But every one of those meetings, and I started this, I think, 12 years ago, I don't use the car to go to the meetings. Every one of those cities, whether it's uh, Claremont, which I take the bike to the train, Gold Line or A Line to Metrolink and Metrolink to Claremont. Coming back sometimes when the meetings go past nine or 10, I've got to get a ride back because there's such no trains or buses running or sometimes I don't want to get home at two o'clock in the morning. But when I go to Santa Clarita, I'll usually get the uh, A-Line, Metrolink, ride the bike to the city hall and get a ride home late at night from one of our staff. So that's, that's going good. Um, last Thursday, I flew with uh, executive board members from AQMD, staff, card members to Reno, Nevada. Took a, a car, several of us, to uh, Sparks. Does anybody know what's in Sparks, Nevada? It's one of the largest something facilities under construction in the United States. Over. Close? Batteries, what is it? Ted, Ted's got it. Ted gets the money. Uh, <laughs> there's a few pennies there. It's, the, it's arguably the largest lithium-ion battery recycling facility in the, in the United States, maybe the world. And the gentleman who was a chief technology officer for, for Tesla for 10 years, J.B. Strobel, was the founder in 2017. So we've got a smaller facility a few miles from there where they're recycling a bunch of batteries. And they said, their staff, we were there for a whole day when I finally got there. It was um, about 200 of our iPhones to make a, a car battery, a lithium-ion car battery. So they're recycling 95 to 96% of all the copper, metal, all the materials are recyclable to be basically sold to GM, Ford, Panasonic, Tesla, et cetera, for lithium ion car batteries. And what they're finding out is that the recycled lithium, which is incredible, this, I, this was interesting talking to some of their chemists, is probably a better and stronger, more dense, powerful lithium than the, the virgin lithium. Just what they found out in original. So it's really incredible. The facility is massive, it's still under construction. Again, they're using your other facility to, to process everything right now. Car batteries, phone batteries, uh, electric bikes, lawn equipment, you know, the electric drills and things you use. And they've got the contracts to pick it all up. So very exciting stuff going on. Closed loop, we don't have to go to China, South Africa, Australia, South America anymore. Also been working closely the last several months with many cities I represent, also in the council of governments. And just two weeks ago, we worked with Claremont, Laverne and um, Duarte got on the phone with Tesla West Coast because again, the San Gabriel Valley is still kind of a desert for supercharger stations, although more and more are popping up. So they're very excited about trying to get it. On the Sierra Madre City Council agenda last week, they have some property at the top of Baldwin right there. Uh, and as I sat in my meeting, I do my presentation, I stick around usually till the end. I couldn't stick to the very end of that, but they said, they first asked Tesla to come put a charging station. Tesla said no. Then Tesla did some studies, and all the people going up there to go hiking, visit the city. <laughs> so many Teslas, they're good, they, they're, they signed an agreement, or we're going to sign an agreement that night to uh, start construction of a Tesla supercharger station right there in Baldwin. Uh, I've been working with a local uh, large business in South Pasadena for the last year and a half, and it's very close. I think he's going to sign or signed to open to uh, start the process. It's probably an eighteen month process. The construction, the you know engineering, design, construction of Tesla charges right here in South Pasadena very soon. Exciting things, the uh, Gold Line, your representative was at the Gold Line uh, track completion ceremony a few weeks ago in Laverne. We took the bike, a couple buses, almost had a fight because I got there at the bus stop first with another family, and some guy shows up and stuck his bike on first. So there's three three bikes area, there's four bikes. I said, sir, here's a big guy. We were here first. He just ignored us. So I asked the lady in the bus, can we put our bikes on here? The guy's being a real jerk. So she let us bring the bike on. The guy was real. We got to the event. It was a great event. And um, 
fabulous. The, the, the train, the tracks on schedule will be done January, 2025. Uh, we're just finishing up the stations now, the overhead catenary system. Tracks are wonderful, looking great. Just hopefully we have some security when it opens up. Um, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, your representative uh, last Monday night at the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy meeting, a lot of stuff going on with LA River, with all the parks from here to, to Ventura. So good stuff. Answer any questions you may have, Your Chair. Uh, no questions, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, I believe we're on to Commissioner Communications. Sorry. Nothing for me. I just have a brief something to um, mention. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the article in the LA Times today about um, the ficus trees that were pruned over by NBC Universal. Um, it opened up an interesting subject, which I think we need to take a, a pretty uh, deep look into when we revise the, the tree ordinance. And that's the habit of severe pruning during um, the hotter months and how it has a very um, detrimental effect to trees. It um, Basically, when you open up the canopy during heat, it makes the bark more susceptible to different diseases. It can't, it doesn't have the resilience it normally does when it's under the canopy of shade. And so it's way more prone to infections and diseases. And the ficus trees have a specific one that affects them. So there's a good chance that they're gonna lose a bunch of those trees. Um, so I would like us to, when we are looking at our ordinance um, this coming year to, um, possibly put in some time limitations on pruning and also the style of pruning we do, um, the, the, that not we do, but that a lot of arborists do is that they call it the coat hanger prune where it looks like a coat hanger at the end because a lot of the vegetation is, is removed. And really, um, it's, it's only an aesthetic thing. It's not a functional thing. It's not a health thing. So I think we should um, consult with an arborist who has um, a lot of knowledge in this area of pruning because I think it will really help inform our ordinance as we move forward. So that's it. Uh, actually, can I ask a question yeah. on that? Um, so I, you, I, I, I assume whenever I see that around town, I always assumed it was because there's like a huge backlog and they're like, we're going to cut this down this deep so that we don't have to touch this tree again for a longer period of time due to resource constriction. Um, did that article ever talk about that? Or is there, did they give any reasons why? Or Well, a lot of these um, large commercial, um, um, well, I like guess NBC Universal probably has its, it happens every year. They have it on their schedule. And um I've noticed around town different parking lots. Um, I think our our city prints at a at a um, a good time of the year. But I think I see I see with regularity the same time of year some of the hottest parking lots get pruned and just devoid of shade. Um, and I think it's simply that's when it's scheduled to happen. Right. maybe from corporate Got it. <laughs> or something like that. But um, there needs to be some repercussions for it because it's not only endangering the health of the tree, but it's the time of year when we need the shade the most. So it makes sense to incorporate that into our, our ordinance moving forward. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I have two. I think you might talk about these in your staff report. Um, the Athens discussion that is ongoing, um, we had a subcommittee here. Um, obviously, from our perspective, as a commission, we decided it makes a lot of sense to move forward with, uh, you know, the new uh, type of uh, trash collection. Um, just hearing some of the comments that are in the community, uh, I know that people would rather uh, keep things as status quo. Um, so I guess this is just a plea to our council, since our council is the one who's going to be voting on this. We know that 20% of 
our recyclables because we're in a single bin uh, can't can't be recycled due to um, contamination. That's obviously once it hits the that MRF, that thing is awesome and it will recycle everything. We've I've been to the facility, but we never get a a tour of the other facility because uh, there's a lot of waste. Um, and so 20% every week is a lot. Um, and so I would just, you know, Casey mentioned the, the general plan coming up and it is centered around a lot of sustainability and environmental programs. Um, we pride ourselves on those and we put them in a lot of plans, but when it comes down to individual projects, uh, they often tend to get voted against. Uh, and so I really hope that we can follow some of our guidelines that the council has actually voted on with these plans and uh, move forward with uh, what this commission has read. Um, and also thank you staff for constantly going out there and getting berated. Um, and then the, uh, the 4th of July parade also would like to uh, commend uh, public work staff. That was awesome. You guys were everywhere out there. Um, it was really cool. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, particularly were those movable bollards. Uh, I assume we're renting them, but I would love to have those things, you know, on that, that we owned and could use them uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I recommend if anyone hasn't made it out to Ventura County Main Street, or sorry, Ventura uh, City Main Street in the past three years, they've completely shut down their, their Main Street with those bollards um, 24 hours a day. Uh, and it's done wonders. I mean, it's already been, it was already a cool street, but um, uh, economically, all the businesses are reporting that it's great. The residents love it, the tourists love it, and I know our city would love it. We just need to prove uh, that uh, it is as cool as we think it is. Um, and so hopefully our mission pilot will be the first thing to show it. Um, but again, if anyone hasn't been there, I definitely recommend heading up to Main Street Ventura um, on a weekend, especially when they have farmer's market. It's pretty amazing. Um, that's it for, for my comments. All right, uh, staff communications. Good evening again. And again, happy Plastics Free July. Um, I wanted to um, let the commission know that we have a new uh, giveaway item that the sustainability division is um, working on. And as you can see, it's the reusable utensils. Thank you very much. Um, we have, um, I believe it comes with a, a spoon and a fork and a knife and you got a straw and some chopsticks. Um, I think there's chopsticks. Um, yes. So um this is one of the items that we had listed in our green action plan, um, which was to push and um, uh, kind of normalize reusables out in public, out when you go out and about to restaurants and stuff. So um, just a little um, token of uh, our appreciation for the commission for sticking to our goals and um, want to let you know plastics is very important to us or plastics reduction. Um, so an update for you on that. I wanted to thank the um, commissioners who did attend our commission Congress last month. I think that was um, a really great event. Um, maybe that is one of the other topics that our plastics task force can talk about when they start discussing um, city events and the use of um, single-use plastic. So that might be um, where we would like to start. Um, wanted to let everyone know that we are, are continuing our leaf blower ban outreach. Um, this month, residents should have received um, a flyer in their trash bills talking more about the uh, ordinance and um, ways to report a violation. We also have coming up this Thursday at the farmer's market, Ace Hardware and Steel will be out there doing a mini leaf blower demonstration. So we'll be out there um, by the small green lawn uh, by the museum. We'll have our tables and canopy and our equipment set out over there. So please stop by and um, test out some equipment if you haven't done so yet. Um, 
we uh, did want to let you know that um, we did update the work plan uh, per the commission's request from last month. Um, so I can, uh, we'll have that update uh, listed on the website as well. Only changes are that we added that extra budget presentation towards the end of the fiscal year, and we've added the plastics task force discussions. And lastly, wanted to touch base on the solid waste uh, community feedback session that we had last week on Thursday. Um, we had a great turnout. I think we had more than 120 folks come out to the event. Um, it was supposed to end at 7.30. We went on until about 8.30. I don't think we left until 9.30. Um, so we had a, a very long discussion. We had Athens Services out there give a presentation on their services, and we had our consultants, MSW consultants out there talking about um, uh, the decisions coming up regarding SB 1383. And um, we got lots of feedback on our current backyard service and the traditional curbside service. Um, we had many folks who had concerns on um, the services that they were currently receiving. Lots of questions out there about what curbside would look like, uh, questions regarding containers, um, parking spaces, um, fees, and all of that good stuff. Um, we will have the presentation uh, and hopefully a summary of the most frequently asked questions uploaded onto our city website. So we will be reaching out to everyone who attended that meeting and doing some more outreach, letting people know that that presentation is available. Um, residents and um, business owners and property owners uh, will still be able to submit their comments and questions um, via email to environmentalprograms at southpasadenaca.gov. Um, our next steps would be to um, uh, summarize all the feedback that we've been receiving from the community. Um, we are uh, waiting on Athens to provide us some more updates on, to, on the uh, options that they had presented to council back in May. So once we have all of that information, we're aiming to go back to city council to present that to, um, present that to them. We're shooting for August um, 16th for that meeting, um, but we'll, we'll definitely provide an update once we have um, more information on that. Um, that's all for my communications, and I believe Ted had a few items as well. Thanks, RP. Just a couple quick items. Um, thanks for your comments on 4th of July. I've been to the Ventura area, and I probably took um, just as many photos of those barriers as I did of my family when we were at the... <laughs> uh, that was, so we, we implemented that this year. That was a great change. Um, so two uh, projects slash programs that we're bringing forward uh, fairly soon. Uh, um, uh, number one is our slow streets, residential slow streets program. So we, we did get council approval to move forward with installing uh, traffic calming um, devices for the entirety of Oak Street. We'll be adding uh, temporary bike lanes for the entirety of um, Grand. And we'll also be adding some additional traffic calming and a short but uh, important bike lane uh, along Hermosa Street. The bike lane will be uh, up that hill um, from like the hillside Hermosa intersection up to Columbia. So we'll actually be um, marking that out next week and then doing the installation the second week of August. So you can see those improvements there. Um, we do have a um, website and a survey that'll be up during the um, project that people can, you know, give their feedback, uh, suggest other streets. And we're planning on rolling out some sort of ambassador program where if people would like slow streets in their area for a future implementation, we can, um, you know, uh, determine which streets will be nominated and then add additional devices to other streets. So um, we do have a set of, um, signs they're like two feet by three feet that um, designate an area a slow area and we have uh, plastic delineators that those signs get placed on so in addition to the streets that we have programmed and have um, designs for um, using staff discretion we can deploy those signs in other residential areas of the city um, that don't necessarily have like you know new markings and things like that but we can put the signs out where it might be appropriate 
um, on a residential street. So we're really excited about that program, really hoping to get a lot of feedback from the community on it. Um, the second thing I'm going to mention is that uh, the council just recently approved our uh, planning consultant for the Fremont and Huntington project. A large part of that project is about active transportation improvements in the city on Fremont and Huntington. Um, and so our objective is to hold uh, a couple of weeks of in-person sort of design workshops at the South Pasadena um, Library Community Room. And so we'll be uh, basically setting up that schedule for the fall so that various community groups in the city, as well as our commissioners, um, other interested parties can join in on that discussion um, and give us their ideas. So if you're a cyclist, you can tell us where you have conflicts and trying to get around the city. Um, if you're a pedestrian, you can talk about areas that you know you think need uh, attention safety-wise on those two corridors. So we're really excited that that's going to be a community-driven um, design process to kick off those projects. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Oh, quick question. Uh, wasn't there an event today? Uh, yeah, today we had um, a groundbreaking ceremony for street improvement projects. So um, on one of the streets that's going to be in the first set of improvements, um, we basically just set up a, a small event to uh, demonstrate that we're starting our capital improvements for streets. So um, the the first set uh, in this in 2023 in the calendar year are um, Sterling Place from Grand Avenue to basically the cul-de-sac where it uh, terminates around Orange Grove on the 110. Um, Forest, just north of Mission, there's a small street there. Uh, the section of Alta Vista from, I think it's Indiana to Oak Crest. And then the biggest part of this is actually the, rem the remainder of Monterey on the um, west side of the city. So from Pasadena Avenue all the way to L.A., We'll be resurfacing, restructuring the street, and we'll be adding the bike lanes in that connect LA uh, up to Pasadena Avenue. So very exciting stuff. Thank you. Sure. I forgot to mention, you may be getting it soon. I, I made a motion at the council meeting. I think I got a second the other night to explore, and I know you love the 4th of July, a change. And that would be to change from the uh, current uh, fireworks show to possibly a drone show like they did in the South Bay, Los Angeles, country of Jordan. So hopefully it comes to you for a recommendation, but we, maybe you'll consider that. But it did make a motion. They're going to look at it. It's good for air quality. Thank you. Chair, I had a few more comments as well. Building off of RP's uh, comment about the reusable utensils, we gifted some to each of you commissioners. And if anyone in the public would like to receive their own utensil kit, we'll be at the farmer's market this Thursday night, as RP had mentioned, and we'll be passing those out if you'd like to take advantage of that. And then one more, I just wanted to say congratulations to Ted and the Public Works Department for breaking ground on these street improvement projects for the fiscal year 23 and 24. And thank you to our city council for coming out, as well as our city manager office for joining the ceremony this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I guess we have some upcoming events. Our LA County Smart Gardening webinars, as always, and our turf removal and native landscaping webinars. Uh, and if there is nothing else, then I would like to adjourn this meeting at 8.46 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>